morning and welcome to the lifting and rigging training here today. Would like to thank those in attendance. We've got people attending um, from Ohio, Colorado, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina. Uh, we have some folks down in the Florida market. So we'd like to thank everyone for being here today. Assisting me with this training here today is gonna be Bob Gubanich. He is our training business unit manager as well as Mike Close, who will be our moderator. When it comes up, when you guys have questions, feel free to go over to the right-hand side in the chat bar and ask your question in real time, and we'll look to get those addressed uh, at the end of this. Uh, and there's also be a little bit interactive as I ask the questions about what looks good and what doesn't look good. Uh, we can share those as well. Without further ado, let's get started here. When it comes to having rigging and going to make a pick, we must make sure that we must plan every lift or plan every pick. So that could be anywhere from an engineered pick drawing where we've got detailed plans on center of gravity, where to find the lifting lug, um, and it's all laid out there for us. And then we also have times where we have to just go uh, in a manufacturing environment and we've got an item there and we've got to go make a pick. But we must stop first and we must have a plan. And that's what we're going to go through in these questions here is, is having that and having that information on how to plan every lift. So here we go. So who is responsible or competent for the lift? We've got the crane operator, which could be an overhead crane operator or the mobile crane operator, and then the rigger. So ultimately both are responsible for this lift and we must make sure that there's always communication established. Again, in a manufacturing environment, this would be verbally. Uh, most likely, or in a heavy type steel mill paper mill, it may be via radio. And then we go to a construction site where probably most of the communication that's taking place between the crane operator and rigger is happen happening via radio as they're signaling steel to be hung or uh, precast items to be set, as well as hand signals. Um, so that's the communication that will be established. So first and foremost, we must understand that communication is going to be established between the rigger and the crane operator themselves. The next question we must ask is, is, is the equipment in acceptable condition? Is it the appropriate type? Is there proper identification or tagging on these slings or rigging items? And when was the last time it was inspected? We must make sure that we're inspecting these items before every time that we use them. Um, so as we can see here on the, on the uh, lower left-hand side, We've got some wire rope with some uh, drop forge clips. Looks like we've got a little bit of a, uh, of a makeshift sling there, but you can see we don't see any tagging here. We see rusting. It's almost like this was used as a winch line. You can see they've actually snapped that piece of wire rope. Uh, looks like something that may have come out of the logging industry, to be quite frank. Um, but again, that is not an acceptable condition. We would know not to use that for a pick. And then here to the right, we've got a chain sling where we've got a grab hook here at one end and I'm not seeing a tag, um, so we cannot use that to go make that pick. And then the other end here, we've got no hook. So appropriate type and proper identification, definitely not. Um, and uh, does it need to be inspected? And it needs to be inspected uh, prior to the pick. So is the equipment in acceptable condition? So if you guys can use that right hand side, uh, is this equipment in acceptable condition? We've got some uh, Crosby hooks. Um, as well as a drop forge clip. Uh, you can see proper identification and working load limit. If I come over here, you can see that Crosby and CM, something that they do in their uh, domestic forging process, is they emboss the working load limit um, on their sling or on their hooks and hardware. So you can see proper identification. You can see the make and manufacturer. You can see the working load limit. Um, a nice feature here on the Crosby items is it keeps you within the 45 degrees on these hooks as well. You can see it, it's listed there. So is the equipment in acceptable condition? Yes, it is. These are brand new. All right, folks. I know we've got some people, some rigging experts on the line here. Um, is this an acceptable, an acceptable condition? And before I point it out, can you write down what's wrong with this? So I'll give you a few uh, seconds here to write down. But So we've got a shackle here. We've got a pin and then we've got a hook and then, then we've got, we're missing some items. So go ahead and type in the comments there um, and write down what you think's wrong with this. 
So what we have here, uh, thank you for all those that have commented. Um, what we have here is a shackle using a commercial grade bolt. Absolutely unacceptable. That bolt is not designed to pick to work with that shackle or to pick up a load. We've got a, a sling hook here uh, where we've got a place for a latch without a latch. You can see the master link here at the very bottom, uh, but that latch needs to be there because under slot condition, that reading can come out. So that is not within acceptable condition. So are the working the limits adequate? Is the capacity of the gear known? Right here, we've got the Mazella seven part. Each wire rope sling, whether it's a single part, um, seven part, nine part braided sling, uh, we, you have to have listed the vertical, the choker, and the, and the basket here. You can see these are listed on the tag. A nice feature about the seven part, it's actually double tagged. Um, that's a really nice feature about it. Right here, we've got a web sling as well. Brand new web sling you can see listed with the DuraClear tag. It's got the vertical, the choker, and the basket there, so we know the capacity of the gear. And we've got a brand new Crosby galvanized shackle here, or we're going to see the work of the limited embossed on the side. So we know going into that pick what our rigging is good to pick up. So we know that what our rigging is good for, but we must start first with the weight of the load. So how much is that load that you're picking up? How much is that WB? How much is that plastic injection mold? How much is that piece of steel? How much is that modular set that's being placed on, on a power plant web on a, on a power plant site? What's the center of gravity going to be? Do you have engineered pick drawings that are going to tell you the center of gravity? Possibly. Uh, in a manufacturing environment, they may come with the item, so you'll know the weight of the load when it comes to that mold. But if you don't have the center of gravity, how do you find it out? Well, Bob's rigging handbook, you pick it up a few inches or feet off the ground and see which way it's going to go and then set it back down and adjust your slings or pick points accordingly. Another question that you must ask is what is the sling angle going to be? And we're going to get into that later because that those sling angles, when they become harsh, they provide extreme tension to the rigging and wire up slings. Will there be any angular or side loading? And we must understand this as well when we're going into the pit. So we must have this plan. So, right here I want to point out, OSHA 1910.184 states slings shall be padded or protected from sharp edges of their loads. We can see here this is a piece of precast. Precast to your hand is probably not very sharp, but this can definitely cut a web sling. So I would like to correct OSHA here and say any edge can cut a sling, whether that's a sharp load or an abrasive type load where you could get a sawing action. Think of a sharp load as being a steak knife. Think of an abrasive type as being a plastic butter knife that is slowly after, after time or load swing and movement is gonna gnaw away at that sling. Again, all slings must be padded against corners, not just your synthetics, because you can see in wire rope and even in chain, when you get broken wires in wire rope or chain, you get metal loss that we must protect um, when we're going around sharp or abrasive edges. In my personal opinion, I would have to say 80% of the rigging accidents or near misses happen because people are cutting the slings, not protecting them against sharp corners or abrasive type corners. Again, a prime example here. Um, what went wrong here? Got what looks like a natural gas turbine. Looks like they tried to pick up this turbine by the box. Um, I would say that that rigging company Knowing that they did that work on a power plant site and transmission, power transmission, probably no longer um, has that contract. Um, you can see the blue uh, round slings here on the ground, just rigged improperly. Right here, we've got some web slings. You can see we've got the tape measure right here. Uh, that tells us that this is a near miss and an accident investigation. So they're trying to replicate where, where on this piece of machinery or on the, on the cutting edge did this sling come in contact with you're going to see it it was a pretty sharp edge here on this web sling because it's a little bit cleaner of a cut right here you're going to see the yarns are degraded and and they look like they're um they were holding on for dear life so you can see the look a little bit different there in that accident investigation again this all comes back that the sling from cutting is prevent preventable when you use the correct type of sling protection, which we're going to look at right here in this slide.
Right here, we've got some twin path slings being utilized in a bridge girder set right there at the very top where the sling comes in contact with the load as well as the load bearing area. We're gonna show that wherever the sling comes in contact with the load, we must have sling protection. This also comes into, into play when using hardware because there could be protrusions or rough surfaces if you use this hardware uh, with a chain sling or a wire rope sling, you could have created a burr on it. If then you switch to a synthetic sling, such as this twin path, you have to have protection on that item. So we must always protect against protrusions and rough surfaces, and in some cases, we're used with hardware. So you must ask the question, again, we're, we're creating this plan. Is the hitch appropriate? Let's assume that this is a long stock item, about 20 to 30 feet of tubular steel with a choke on it in the middle. Is that hitch appropriate? I'm gonna tell you I don't think that that hitch is appropriate because you do not have a lot of load control with it. Uh, my professional recommendation if you're making picks like that is you use some kind of a spreader bar configuration and then two slings with chokes. Right here, we've got a double wrap hitch. Let's assume that this piece of uh, precast pipe is only four to six feet. Well, in this case, the double wrap hitch provides nice 360 degrees of contact. So we've got 360 degrees of contact, then back into a choke. I would say that you have really good load control and that hitch is appropriate to go make that pick. Is the hitch appropriate here in this case? We've got a double choker hitch, got nice protection and a choke on it, not too severe of an angle, looks to be about a 45, but we're gonna talk later why that needs to be derated if we get to that 45 in that choke. That looks like a good pick right there. Now this piece of steel pipe coming down off the excavator, double basket hitch. Do you wanna be the worker in the trench? I tell you what, I, I don't wanna be. Uh, you think that that hydraulics of that backhoe could be a little jerky? We've got a double basket hitch. We've got nowhere for this, this web sling to really butt up against. So if you get that load swing going, you could lose that load by sliding it out. So is a hitch appropriate? And then is a tagline needed? I know we've got a number of construction folks on here. Uh, when we get into that outdoor environment and we've got loads flying high, uh, would like to see that load control with the tagline. So now we're gonna get into selecting the sling hitches for load control. We've got just the, uh, the vertical, which we've got a connection point here. We're gonna assume these triangles are like shackles. Uh, we've got a choker hitch, and then we've got a true vertical basket hitch. Um, so your, really the load will be applied in the rigging environment will determine the type of uh, hitch that you're gonna use. And here's gonna be some examples. A single leg with some load control. They provide good control for only simple loads, um, and really do not use this hitch for lifting loose materials. Um, loose materials, maybe, maybe being a bundle of rebar in a single type uh, load, a bundle of steel or loose items uh, as it can tip or you can get a sag in them. Um, so we'd recommend not using a single leg or a choke in that type of configuration. A choker hitch. A choker hitch does not provide 360 degrees of contact, but is a really viable option when going to hang steel or pipe or items in the air like that. Uh, because you do get at least a, a good amount of surface area coverage here. Right here, it looks like we've got a steel coil or some type of cylindrical item. We've got nice load control on that. So when you're using a choker hitch, we can use a block of wood between the hitch, um, not steel, to improve that load grip and angle of the choke. Right here is a basket hitch. Um, and this basket hitch, we have, actually have a double wrap again. We've got 360 degrees of contact there. And make sure we don't overlap the sling at the bottom. So when using web slings, if you, if you overlap, you could create abrasion at the bottom there. And those web slings do melt at 194 degrees if there was some severe abrasion. Uh, wire rope slings as well. Uh, make sure that we're not overlapping so we're getting that full 360 degrees of contact. I'm a big fan of that double wrap hitch. Um, but when we're doing this, 
in a basket type configuration, we must take into account the horizontal angle because a basket hitch that's listed on that sling tag is meant to come to two points, not to a singular, and we must derate properly because of the tension that's being provided on those slings. And we'll work through some math a little bit later on. Double wrap choker hitch. Um, again, we're looking here, we've got the 360 degree contact. We know not to overlap on that hitch. So we're, losing, we're using slings and a spreader bar. Right here is a perfect application for when we have, um, I'm gonna continue to use rebar because we see that a lot on construction sites, or you're flying multiple pieces of steel in a bundle, um, or you're, you're moving PVC pipe, um, and you have that, think about that sag factor. We, you should definitely use a spreader bar than with two chokes. Uh, this is a great way to pick long stock bundle items. You can see here is it provides very good load control on these longer loads. And it really is gonna depend on the rigidity of that load as well, uh, whether to use just a singular choke or a double, because it really comes into the sag factor uh, on that load control. So double basket. Um, the load control on this is not good unless the slings are snubbed against a corner. Um, my professional recommendation, unless you're making the same pick on the same product over and over, that this double basket creates efficiency, I would professionally recommend not to use this type of chain sling because it's not very versatile. As you can see, it's been sold or set up just for one item. So if it creates efficiency in moving that one item and you're making a thousand items a day, maybe it makes sense for you. But in general construction and manufacturing, I definitely professionally recommend not to buy this type of sling. Again, because it's not as versatile and you must have it snubbed against corners. Because again, if we get that load going and stop that overhead crane, or mobile crane, you could possibly lose a load if it's not snubbed against the corner. So what we have here, we're going to make a pick with a, with a web sling. Ultimately, you've got the work of the limit of the sling. You know how much the item weighs, but what happens when you lose that load either to the right or left? That's force that's being applied. So if this product right here is good for, weighs 6,000 pounds and this web sling is good for 6,400 pounds, You'd have to do the math, but there is possibility that the force of this load swing will cause that you to have an overage on the work and the limit right here of this web sling. Again, we don't have the center of gravity here uh, on, on this item as well. You can see we've got uh, two basket hitches being used, not snubbed against corners. I would not use that. So class here, what can you tell me? Um, why does this pick look good here? We just covered it a few slides ago. And also we referenced using this block of wood. Can you tell me why on the right hand side, why you think that's good? Again, if we've got questions as we go through this um, class here today, just ask them. Uh, we're going to address them at the very end. So go ahead and get your questions in now. I know last class we had a number of them and we'll look to address all of them. So now we're going to talk about tensions when it comes to slings, um, as well as what that does for the work in the limit. So I want you to sit back and envision yourself holding two five-gallon buckets of water, and you're going to have to hold your arms out with your shoulders. So think of it at 60 degrees, 45 degrees, and 30 degrees. What if I asked you to hold those buckets of water out for five minutes? Well, at 60 degrees, you could probably do it. At 45 and 30, if I asked you to hold those five gallon buckets out full of water, you're gonna see what kind of tension that that would have on your shoulders. So I want you to remember this concept as we work through the tension when it comes to derating slings properly. So, a choker hitch. When we're using the choker hitch, there's an angle reduction chart that must be used with it. So you can see we've got it laid out, zero to 60 degrees right here, 90 to 105 degrees, 105 to 120, and then 120 to 180. So here, and then the reduction factor that you must take into account on that choker hitch. So here's an example. 
Let's say we've got a three-eighths, eight-foot wire rope sling. Common use sling when you're looking at, at hanging steel or um, hanging most items, you, a very common construction sling, zero to 60 degrees. Well, what's listed there on the choke for that sling and the working load limit is 5,120 pounds, stated on the tag. Let's say that this is a very round item, big radius on it. And we have a 30 degree on that sling. The work in the limit is only gonna be now 2,560 pounds or a 0.5 loss factor when we get down into 30 degrees. Let's do this same, oh, let's do a sling here from 90 to 105 degrees. So we got a three quarter inch choker, six foot wire rope sling. The work in the limit on that choker is 8,200 pounds. At 80 degrees of this sling, we have to reduce the work and load limit to 5,822 pounds or a 0.71 loss factor. If you'd like to see this example shared with you, go ahead and comment on the right side uh, and we can share this slide with you after. Let's continue on and talk about a basket hitch. This is a true vertical basket hitch. The item right here, is not a true vertical basket hitch, and there will be a work of the limit times loss factor on this. So at 60 degrees, horizontal angle, you have to drop to 0 0.8660 in that basket. At 45, you've got to drop uh, to 0 0.7071. And at 30 degrees, remember that that's a harsh angle. If you've got to hold those five gallon buckets of water at 30 degrees, um, for two minutes, it's going to be really a lot of tension, a lot of stress on your shoulders. As that example, you got to drop to 0.5. The reason we point this out, the way slings are tagged is for a true vertical basket and to double up that vertical. And here's some examples. Example again of a 3 8 wire rope sling at a 45 degree, so 45 degree, coming back to a singular pick point, a singular shackle or hook. The work and load limit on that sling is 2.9 tons at 5,800 pounds as stated on the tag. At 30 degrees, we have to reduce the work and load limit to 2,900 pounds or a 0.5 loss factor. We've got an example of a web sling. So an EE2902 by six foot web sling at 30 degrees. The basket is gonna state 12,800 pounds on the tag. At 30 degrees, again, you're gonna have that 0.5 loss factor. You're gonna reduce the work and the limit of that sling to 6,400 pounds. Again, we've got our math up here. And remember the 60 degree, 45 degree, and 30 degree roughly. So think of the tension again. Calculate the sling to the load angle. Determine the corresponding tension factor. And this is another way of looking at it. Multiple load uh, weight by the tension factor determine the load of the sling legs. Leg or legs, plural. Uh, this is another tension factor chart. You can sling, see sling angle A and then the tension factor. Right here, 90 degrees, you got a one tension factor. At 70 degrees, it's 1.064. Let's go into some common, common ones such as a 45, you know, all, all know what a 45 degree looks like. That's 1.414. And then the 30 degree, two. We're gonna discuss the tension factor here. So the load weight, let's assume it weighs 2,000 pounds. The sling to load angle is 60 degrees. So we've got a nice 60 degree angle here. The load weight is a 1.155 tension factor. Increase sling tension, to 2,310. We've got a load weight of 2,000 at 45 degrees. The load weight, 1.414 tension factor, increased sling tension to 2,828 pounds. You can see if you double up these, you'll get to that math there. Again, another example here at 30 degrees. Remember 30, it's a two tension factor. So we increase the sling tension to 4,000 pounds. 
So are the working load limits adequate? All right, here, what's the sling angle? Go ahead and answer in that box. What does this sling angle look like? What's the weight of the load? Include, now, if you're gonna design a pick in an indoor manufacturing environment, we've gotta take into account the weight of the load being anything coming off the hook. So the chain sling, the below the hook item here, which is a magnet, and the steel that it's picking up. All right, for those that answered, what kind of angle is that? That looks to be at about a 45 degree angle right there. So what's listed on the tag for this chain sling is 60 degrees. To design this pick, we must have taken into account that it's at 45 degrees to size that chain properly. So a uh, thank you for all those in attendance. Uh, we've got our sling working the limits guide here because we can't pack all this information onto that small sling tag. So it's listed here, it's very small. These are large posters that if you ask for them, we can get them to your job site. Uh, and then we're also gonna share a link with the PDF. Um, so we've got it listed out here. Great for job site trailers, safety boards, 5S boards um, in manufacturing facilities. Um, so let us know, uh, these are great charts to use or have on your job site or in your facility. So. When we go to make a pick, we want to think about all the rules and regulations and standards that apply. Right here, we've got ASME B30.10 is the hook. B30.9 is the sling itself. B3020 is the below the hook lifter. B3026 is rigging gear hardware. If you've got any questions or would like to see an excerpt from one of the ASME, please reach out to us. We can have our lifting specialist uh, contact you and provide a snippet for interpretation on it. I'd like to thank everybody for attending this YouTube live training here today. Uh, my name again is uh, Adam Franz. I'm the regional sales manager uh, in the Mid-Atlantic region. Here's my mobile number as well as my email, or you can find me on LinkedIn. So at this point, I'm gonna introduce, we've got Bob Gubanich who's gonna come on uh, and talk to you uh, about our resources card as well as our training. So go at it, Bob. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Stay with us. I know we're getting close to the 30-minute limit, but if you can hang on for a few extra minutes, the, the best part is yet to come, and that's the part where we answer your questions. Hopefully, you learned something worthwhile here today. If you like what you saw, please visit our website, mazellacompanies.com, and go to the resources section. There you will find videos, blogs, and eBooks covering a wide range of rigging questions from how to inspect a synthetic round sling to sling tagging requirements. While on the web, head over to liftingyou.com and take a look at our two minute YouTube video on an exciting new product that's been very successful, our new remote live training classes. This innovative training format offers many advantages over face-to-face -face training and enables your company to meet social distancing requirements and still follow the ASME requirement for training your workforce. Well, with that, Mike, you've got some questions teed up. Let's uh, answer some questions. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Adam. Great, great job to the both of you. Um, yeah, we got some questions here in the chat. One we got from OH Steeler. How does a double wrap affect the uh, load rating on a lift? Uh, the double wrap doesn't affect the capacity at all. It increases the uh, contact to the load and gives you that 360 degree contract, but it doesn't actually affect the capacity of the sling one way or the other. You just simply need a longer sling to be able to go around the load you're lifting. And of course, the double wrap can be used with both the choker and the basket hitch. Great. Uh, we've got a question here from Brian Bell that came in the chat. Uh, Adam, can you go back and talk? You showed a image up on one of your slides where there was a block of wood that was involved in the rigging and the, the load securement. Can you go back and talk about why that block of wood might be used? Yes. So great question. The block of wood would be used um, with that load to, uh, to give a more beneficial angle to that choke. So, um, so you would use, so if your angle was harsh at a, at a 30 degree or 60 degree, it, you could use that block of wood um, to help to increase your angle, 
but you could also use that block of wood uh, to help cinch down on the load itself. Great. I got one for you, Bob. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the retirement criteria for wire rope slings when it comes to broken wires on a sling? Sure. Uh, unfortunately, the the criteria for rejection for wire rope slings and broken wires is, is a little tricky and a little complicated. Um, the simple answer is yes, you are permitted to have a few broken wires in a sling, providing they, they meet the correct uh, recommendations. And what I would recommend for, for you to do to get more information on that is to either go onto our, uh, our webpage or reference your OSHA or ASME specifications. Because you are, again, permitted to have a few broken wires, but depending on the distribution of those broken wires, the locations, uh, and, and the type of sling you have, there's a lot of different factors that you have to consider before uh, you can decide whether that uh, wire rope sling is safe to use. Great. We got a lot of questions here about uh, sling inspection. Got one about flat web slings and the red core yarns. Is that still ret uh, retirement criteria when you're inspecting a, a nylon or polyester web sling? So I'll take this one. Um, so um, probably some, as Bob would say, gray beards at the group that uh, oftentimes um, back in the day, th th there was in all web sling products, a red core yarn. And some did use that as an inspection criteria. That is not the case. You are not to inspect based off that red core yarn. Um, so it's been taught and it's not correct that, that you could use it until you see that red core yarn. That is not correct. If you have any kind of cut, nick, gouge, um, uh, fluffy type area of the sling where you can see degraded yarns, that is the retirement criteria. And on our website, we've got some great pictures of the retirement criteria for web slings that provide examples specifically of what a nick or, or a cut looks like or a puncture. Um, so a red core yarn, you do not use that as retirement criteria or anything in a web sling. And is an old school um, training method, but it is not correct. All right. Uh, we've got another one here from Christina from the chat. Again, going back to wire rope slings, when is a kink or a dog leg uh, too much when you, when you make the determination that that sling should be pulled from service? Uh, great question. And it happens a lot because uh, wire rope slings lend themselves to having that type of, of deformation if you use them a couple of times. So the, the, the kind of the best rigging practice as a rule of thumb is if, the, if there are no uh, displaced strands. So the first thing you want to look at in that area of the dog leg or the kink is for a displaced strand. If you have a displaced strand criteria for rejection, the sling's done. If the strands are all in, uh, in place where they're supposed to be, if you put a load on that sling, uh, that would be the working load limit. And if that dog leg straightens out under those conditions, then you would consider that sling safe to use. Most of the time, a kink is more serious than a dog leg, and you're going to actually have deformation of wires and strands, and that's going to require rejection of the sling. So again, the short answer is if under load, the dog leg pulls straight and you have no deformation of strands, it's, uh, that sling is still safe to use. Okay. Um, got, got another question here regarding wire rope. Um, on wire slings, do all wire lifting cables need to be labeled with weight capacity or only one leg of the sling? Example, I have a lifting harness with three legs. Only one leg is labeled, which I'm assuming means uh, he's got one tag, but I'm told that they all need to be tagged. Well, I'll look to address this question. Um, if you've got a, a wire rope bridle where there is a master link, where there is a, a swage, um, end to it, and you cannot remove those items, you would only require one tag on it. Um, if you do, if those items are removable and your collector ring, um, that you, it's only attached by a shackle or there is any way that it could be removed, um, then each of those items would need to be tagged individually. Um, I hope that addresses your question. So if it's a wire rope bridle, um, and the bridle is, 
is on a master link and it is a swaged eye onto it, you only need one tag. But if it is a bridle that could be, that you could add another leg or take a leg off, each individual piece of rigging uh, must be must have a tag on it. Great, thank you. We've got one here about rigging hardware. Uh, Bob, how do we tighten the shackle pin on a screw pin anchor shackle? Great question. Uh, again, Adam uh, likes my reference to the gray beards in the group. Um, I'm getting a little gray in myself, as you can see, but. Uh, Back in the day, especially for iron workers and steel workers, uh, they actually used to uh, train people to tighten up the pin hand tight on a screw pin anchor shackle and then back it off an eighth to a quarter turn. Um, that is not the correct way to utilize a shackle. We want to make sure that that shackle pin is fully tightened hand tight before we use it. Uh, if we start off with a loose pin, there's too much opportunity for that pin to continue to loosen up and, and, and actually fall out of the shackles. So we want to make sure that our screw pin anchor shackles have pins that are hand tight before we do our lift. We've got uh, another one here that comes back to sling inspection. On polyester round slings, what is the proper procedure uh, if you discover a rip or a tear in the outer jacket of that round sling during the course of a inspection? So the rip or the tear, I'll take this one, in the polyester um, round sling, it depends on if, if you can see the core yarn on it. Um, if you have access to the core yarn, it's done uh, at that point. Um, there are large round slings uh, that can be repaired, um, but a lot of the smaller round slings are consumable. Um, so I would say anything less than a 30,000 pound, pound work in the limit round sling, it's probably good just to discard at that point. It doesn't make sense to repair, but anything on over 30,000 pound work in the limit, you can repair. And again, if you can see the core yarns, it's gotta go. Okay, uh, we've got one here from Robert Ivey. Uh, are you allowed to use a wire rope sling as long as the dog leg pulls straight under a load and there are no obstructed wires? Compare that to a dog leg, not a kink in an overhead crane wire rope. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what the question is there, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer it as best I understand it. I, I think we're trying to make a comparison between a wire rope sling and a running rope on a, on a hoist or a crane. Uh, you've got different specifications for the two products, especially for broken wires. Uh, but as far as the kinking is concerned, again, what you're looking for is, uh, is deformation of the, of the strand and of the wires. So if, you, if you're using an overhead crane and you see a little bit of a, a dog leg, uh, but again, when the line is under tension, it pulls straight and there's no damage or deformation to the strands or the wires, uh, you're okay. With a wire rope sling, uh, you're going to see a kink. A kink, again, is a much more serious uh, bit of damage. And the same would apply in a, in a running rope on a crane. If you had an actual kink, you're going to have deformation and damage that's going to require replacement. Just to step in there and, and comment with Bob, uh, it's two different standards, a running rope uh, versus a wire rope sling, where a, a running rope is much more stringent uh, on that. Than a, than a wire rope sling when it comes to dog legs and kinks. Great, uh, looks like we got one more here. So what information is required, um, what type of identification information is required on a shackle besides the, the capacity? All right, um, there must be a manufacturer's name or marking, uh, must have a, have a working load limit and a, in, in a diameter of size. Bob, did I miss any on the hardware? No, you got them basically right. You, you need the capacity, you need the uh, manufacturer's identification, and then like you say, a size, the three items. And again, that can be a problem. We do see some, especially import manufacturers that, that put a country of origin, but that doesn't meet the requirement of having an actual manufacturer's identification. So something to look for on your shackles. And, and just to piggyback on that comment, uh, I've seen shackles in the field that, that, that say China on them and then a diameter uh, and a working load limit. 
China is not a manufacturer or a manufacturing code, um, according to ASME B30, um, I believe not, uh, two six is hardware. 30.26, correct, yes. Well, I think we're probably getting to the end of our timeline here. Mike, any pressing questions we need to make sure we, we include here? Or Yeah, and, and as always, you know, if you have any additional questions, you can send an email to afranz at mozellacompanies.com. Adam would be happy to field any additional questions that you guys have. Uh, there were a lot of questions here in the chat about sling inspection. If you go to liftingu.com, we have a course that you can enroll in. It's got seven lessons with video demonstrations on how to properly inspect each of the types of lifting slings to the ASME B39 standards. So check that out if you get a chance. Again, that's at liftingu.com. Uh, thanks again to everybody that signed in and stuck with us here for the q and I'm going to turn it back over to Adam and Bob to wrap things up. Well, I'd like to thank you all for taking a few minutes out of your busy day today and, and spend those with us on, on behalf of, of Adam and myself and the Mozilla companies. Please stay safe, not only on the job, but in everything you do. Thank you. Thank you for everybody who came and joined us in attendance. I know we've got folks practicing social distancing. Um, in conference rooms, in, uh, in job trailers, uh, and some that are set up remotely. So we'd just like to thank everyone who attended. Um, and if you've got any questions after this, feel free to reach out and uh, please stay safe during this time and consider us here as, at Mozilla if you have any questions. Have a great day.